is uh, part is the second part of a series of uh, webinars that we had planned uh, with in partnership with LabNet. Uh, so we have uh, signed as the Modern Civil Engineering and Architecture at AUB a memorandum of understanding with LabNet, which is the Lebanese network of um, business professionals in North America. And we called it the uh, SMOU to have a Silicon Valley channel at NSF. We have experts from LabNet uh, join us remotely through webinars uh, and share uh, valuable experiences and insights and knowledge about specific topics. Uh, they share them with our students, with our faculty members, and staff as well. Uh, so I would uh, like to uh, thank LabNet for having this partnership with us. And I would like to thank Nadine as well. Nadine Nakat for uh, overseeing this uh, uh, this channel. So Nadine, just if you would like to say a few words about the Silicon Valley channel, and then I will introduce our speaker and today's event. Yes, uh, thank you, Mona. Uh, so basically, uh, this uh, uh, this Silicon uh, channel uh, is uh, to uh, talk about uh, topics mainly related to technology and entrepreneurship. Uh, and as Mona mentioned, this is the second of uh, the talks. Uh, the first uh, talk uh, tackled the topic of uh, brain monitoring. And today, Mr. Mark will uh, talk also about, uh, discuss the topic of intellectual uh, property. Uh, and Mona will elaborate for, further on that. Uh, we are also working uh, a lot with LabNet on uh, uh, different uh, channels and all are related to, uh, to research and uh, collaborations between us here in AUB and specifically at MSFEA uh, with uh, LabNet and uh, all the Lebanese experts uh, in technology who are based in uh, Silicon Valley. So um, that's it. I'm going to give it back to you, Mona. All right, good. Thank you, Nadine, so much for your input and uh, with helping organize this. So um, for those who do not know me, I'm the coordinator of the Entrepreneurship Initiative at the MSFA at AUV. And we always care to bring uh, the best knowledge to our students, faculty and staff when it comes to entrepreneurship. And as you all know, when it comes to innovative entrepreneurship, which is really what engineers are capable of doing, uh, a very important topic arises, which is the topic of intellectual property rights and issues. So this is why we have worked with LabNet to secure um, a reputable and um, a subject matter expert on this topic to be with us and to uh, let us learn more about the, the essentials of IP, uh, intellectual property rights and issues. So we're going to not just cover basic, the basic characteristics of the differences and the types of intellectual property. However, we're going to talk more about how it's relevant to entrepreneurs and how what could be done with IP protection if it's obtained. Uh, of course, there's a huge controversy in entrepreneurship, especially with 21st century entrepreneurship, whether you know it's important to invest time and effort and money in obtaining um, a protection of IP, patents, et cetera, because some entrepreneurs say it's a waste of time, other entrepreneurs say it's very important and it's needed. So uh, hopefully we can uh, dwell on that. And uh, by the end of the session, those of you who are thinking of their entrepreneurial projects can have an answer. Of course, there is no right answer there, but it's, uh, it's a session to help you with that decision. So I would like to introduce our speaker uh, I thank him a lot for joining us uh, at uh, you know the very morning. He's it's 8 a.m. his time and the Pacific time. So Mr. Mark Abu Mirai is a partner with the law firm of Knob Martins and has over 20 years of experience in the practice of all aspects of IP law, with a focus on complex patent matters. He assists clients from solo investors to multinational corporations with the many stages of IP development, from generating to monetizing IP. Mr. Abu Mere has also served as a patent law expert in U.S. court matters and related proceedings. He has been an adjunct professor of law teaching various topics in patent law for over 15 years. In addition to his law practice, Mr. Abu Mere periodically serves as a judge pro tempore with the San Diego Superior Court in California. So we are very privileged to have you with us. I'd just like to mention a few housekeeping rules before we give the floor to Mr. Abu Mere to share his presentation and to start taking us through what he has prepared. Uh, for anybody who would like to uh, ask a question, 
you can either type it in the chat box or you can raise your hand. So basically, uh, we are going to make sure that everybody is muted just to have uh, you know, a noise free uh, webinar. However, this doesn't mean that we don't want to listen from you. So basically, if you just have any question and you believe that you would like to uh, intervene, uh, we are very open to this. Just raise your hand and we will make sure to give you uh, the floor to speak. Uh, however, if you would like to share your question in the chat box, also feel free to do so and we will make sure to answer it. And of course, at the end of the session, we will also open the floor for questions and answers. We would like this to be an interactive session, so please make sure to, um, to post your questions or raise your hand. So with that, uh, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Mark uh, in order to share with us his presentation. So I will just uh, stop sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, well, thank you so much. Let me just, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. So thank you so much, Mona, for the uh, wonderful introduction here. Um, yeah, believe it or not, uh, 8 a.m. is fairly early for most lawyers here, so we don't usually get up and start working at this hour, but um, I'm actually very pleased to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just expand my uh, document here and see if this works. Are we good? Yes, this is much better. Okay, good. Let me, uh, and I do want to expand your window here. Okay. There we go. I'm trying to get the chat uh, before we get started, just the chat uh, button here going. So if somebody raises a question via chat, I'll be able to see it. I guess it will pop up. Anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And if there's any technical issues, I'm sure that Mona will, will raise that uh, to my attention. As she mentioned, my name is uh, Mark Abomeri. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Kenobi Martins here in San Diego. Uh, and uh, today I'm giving a talk on the fundamentals of intellectual property. Uh, you know, what I'm going to talk about today is really uh, the what and why uh, about intellectual property, but not really the how, the actual mechanics of obtaining uh, protection under the, the various systems. Uh, also, everything that I'm going to talk about today actually uniformly pretty much applies across multiple jurisdictions around the world. Uh, a lot of the countries, uh, they pretty much use the same principles. Uh, and this is not because uh, they want to do what the United States does. Actually, a lot of European countries and Asian countries do not want to do that. But that's because uh, they're subject to international treaties in which the, the countries have to conform to. Uh, so uh, that is why there's a, a sense of harmonization if you go from the US uh, to Japan, say, to the EPO, European Patent Office in Germany. Um, also, uh, I... Uh, I've been doing this for a while, meaning I've been um, not only practicing IP law, but also I've been teaching and lecturing for, for a long time. And uh, this is uh, one of the very few times where I do it to a computer. So I usually, uh, you know, I do encourage a lot of interaction. I want you to make a lot of noise if you have questions uh, and, and let me know because this is a uh, uh, the subject matter is fairly uh, abstract in the sense that it, it is not uh, something that you could just understand in a you know, 10 minute or 20 minute or one hour session. It's a very iterative process where we build you know, layers of information on top of each other. So you really have to understand the previous layer before we actually move on to the next topic. So if there's something that, that is not clear, uh, make sure uh, that you uh, let me know. 
uh, I'm going to be using a lot of some terminology that's not may not be familiar, but uh, I'll try to avoid that or I'll try to at least explain that what I do. Okay, uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started and talk about what intellectual property is. And the first slide you'll see is a disclaimer, uh, just to make sure that uh, by my presentation today, I am not establishing any attorney client privilege or providing any uh, legal advice. The discussion today that I'm having is purely for educational purposes. Uh, and therefore, if you do need to uh, an advice or an opinion on um, IP law, you should seek uh, an opinion of counsel. Um, so, uh, Kenobi Martins uh, started back in the early 1960s in Orange County, uh, I think in the city of Anaheim, uh, uh, Santa Ana. Uh, Santa Ana is very close to Anaheim. If you've been to Southern California, Anaheim is where uh, Disneyland is. Um, and uh, it started by uh, four partners, uh, Lois Kenobi, uh, Daryl Olson, Don Martins, and Jim Baer. Um, two of the founding members are still uh, present today, and they, and they do uh, come periodically uh, to the firm and participate in some of our events. We have offices throughout the United States. Uh, we're now up to seven or eight offices, both on the East Coast and the West Coast. And of course, over the years, we could have expanded internationally uh, seamlessly, but uh, it is by decision, by choice, that we don't want to do that. Uh, we actually have uh, over 275 lawyers, I should have updated the slide, and patent scientists working at the firm in the various offices and our practice is exclusively uh, intellectual property law. Uh, we don't do any corporate law or securities law or, or any other type of uh, area of practice. Uh, so we're experts in, in the area of intellectual property. Uh, intellectual property, because of its nature, because of patents, you have to have a technical background. So more than 95% of our attorneys have uh, technical you know, engineering or medical degrees. A lot of them have MD, PhD, in addition to the Juris Doctor degree before they became lawyers. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of them have also engineering degrees as such as myself, both undergraduate and graduate degrees. And also we have industry experience. The practice is global in nature. Uh, not that we are experts in jurisdictions outside the U.S., but we have um, a network of foreign associates that we work with, uh, mandated by the clients we represent. We represent a lot of U.S. clients that do have markets in China or Japan or Australia or Europe, and therefore they need the intellectual property protection in those jurisdictions. Uh, so what is intellectual property? Uh, normally, when I'm in an in-person presentation, I won't continue until I get an answer. But, uh, uh, but the, on this occasion, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. So intellectual property is really a category of various types of properties. Uh, these properties are considered under the law. They're personal properties. They're like uh, your car. Uh, your your clothing or your iPhone or, or, or cell phone. Uh, they're not like real property. They're not like real estate. And that has uh, consequential effects on how the law treats them. So um, we start out, you've heard of copyright. So that's one form of, co of, uh, of intellectual property. Another one is trademark. Uh, and a third one is uh, trade secrets. And, and the fourth one and the most complicated one or probably most uh, disputed and, and you know, uh, contentious in, in uh, US courts would be patents. Uh, <clears throat> so what I'm gonna cover each one of these and then later on focus on, on patents and the process involved in obtaining patents. But you'll see that each one of them covers different aspect of a property. 
and uh, it gets its own treatment uh, under the law. Um, so if you have ideas, so you have an idea of how to uh, combat the COVID-19, very timely topic, and you came up with a chemical or a process or a composition to combat that uh, virus, uh, that would be the idea of, of how to do that. That would be something that's protectable under two types of intellectual property. <clears throat> you can keep it to yourself, the idea, and treat it as a trade secret. And in the United States, a trade secret happens to be uh, a state-specific body of law. It's not governed by the federal jurisdiction. And therefore, uh, different states have minor variations of how to apply it. But basically, a trade secret is uh, information that's generally not known in the public domain and that has an independent economic value and that you, the owner of the trade secret, you actually safeguard it in a way and take the procedures and the proper processes to keep it secret. You know, if it's in the document, you stamp it confidential, you bring it home or to the office, you lock it up. Uh, or if it's on a computer file, you encrypt it, you make it secure. So you have to take the steps to keep it secret. The life term of a trade secret is theoretically perpetual, it can last forever. But uh, the issue with trade secret is it could be reverse engineered, it could be identified by somebody else independently, and therefore, once that happened, the trade secret vanishes, the value of the trade secret vanishes. So you are at the mercy of someone else developing the idea or identifying the secret that you have, um, you know, this doesn't mean that companies don't have trade secrets. A lot of companies have trade secrets and, and they keep it as such. And trade secret has a broader net, meaning that it doesn't have generally more than those three requirements that I mentioned earlier. Uh, if it satisfies those three requirements, not generally known, it's got an independent economic, you know, financial value, and you keep it secret, that's generally a trade secret. So if somebody misappropriates the trade secret, misappropriation meaning transfers it without authorization, copies it, then you can go to court and seek remedy. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and there is no international treaty governing that, that activity. So that is, the, uh, that, that is what trade secret is. Patents uh, on the other side, they are also uh, vehicles, intellectual property vehicles that protect ideas. But rather than getting the idea by just operation of law by things that you do, you actually have to go to a government office. Uh, and this applies anywhere, uh, whether you're in Lebanon or in uh, Netherlands or in the US, you have to go to a government office and seek protection. Basically, you go to the, to the government and you say, I have this idea, it's an invention, and uh, I'll go later through the requirements of, of patents, and I want to own that property. So I need a certificate, uh, we call that uh, a document of patents or a document of title, where they give you actually um, a certificate of ownership uh, for the uh, patent. and. Uh, Jurisdictions in the, uh, across the world are generally split into two types of systems. You have what's called examination jurisdictions and you have registration jurisdictions. Uh, so whereby um, to get that patent ownership, the examination jurisdictions such as the United States and most around the world uh, would have to examine, evaluate your invention and make a decision whether it meets the criteria and then after several months or years makes a decision to give you that ownership and likewise uh, in the registration jurisdictions uh, such as france uh, is a registration jurisdiction 
whereby you file uh, your request for patent protection and they just give you a registration. They don't do examination. They, the process is based on the principle that why bother with examination if you're not going to actually enforce your patentable rights? We'll, so examination happens once you actually want to sue somebody. Um, so, uh, so that's generally the, the two systems. That's all I'm going to say on this slide here. So we can uh, move forward. The patent uh, does have a lifetime. Uh, it is uh, the, the term of the patent is for 20 years from the first filing, uh, and, and that's anywhere in the world. Uh, it's it's 20, 20 years, and, and that was done by um, a treaty that was. Uh, entered, uh, modified in the early 2000, maybe November 2000 or November 1999. I can't remember now. It's been around for about 20 years. Before that, the, the duration was different. Okay, uh, what if you want to protect not the idea itself, not the algorithm, so to speak, but you want to protect the expression of that idea? So as I talked, I, I raised two hands here. Um, and I um, express my idea by making these gestures here. If that's the image that I want, the expression that I want to protect, I do not go to the patent route or the trade secret route. I, I have to go through the uh, copyright uh, route, for example, whereby I can go again to the government and ask it to give me a copyright uh, registration. Uh, we'll go through some of the requirements of copyright. They're much less stringent than patent law. But there's also something that uh, protects the figurative aspect of an expression. So if you have a sculpture or uh, a specific design of a mouse, you know, a computer mouse that has a specific shape, you can actually get a design patent uh, that also uh, could be protectable on that. Both of them will require that you go to the Patent office. Okay. Uh, there's a third type of protection is uh, what if you want to become like Chanel or Gucci or Apple? You want to actually get economic leverage based on the identity of a brand, of a uh, a brand that identifies the source of goods or services because it has a specific uh, quality uh, level in the mind of the consumer. That's where you go to uh, trademarks. And uh, uh, trademark protection uh, in the United States is actually, to confuse you, it's both state governed and also governed by the federal jurisdiction, I meaning you can get the trademark application to cover the entire United States, or you get one just for the state in which the trademark operates. But bottom line, uh, uh, also trademark is a little bit complex. Uh, it's got a complexity in the sense that the trademark rights can operate uh, indefinitely as long as you're using the mark uh, to protect the brand. And the rights arise without the necessity for registration. We call those common law rights in the United States. That's something more unique to the US. But you actually can sue somebody based on their common law rights. Now, with uh, electronic media and, and uh, uh, the world is much smaller, everything is, uh, is done through registration. And for trademarks, we do have international treaty that also governs operation among the multiple jurisdictions. Uh, so what kind of rights do I need to uh, just decide where to place the window here? Do you get for each aspect of, of, of intellectual property? Uh, so typically you get the right to exclude other people from using your property. So if you own a car, uh, you have conventionally the right to stop others from using the car. They cannot come and occupy your car. 
And at the same time, in the context of a car or personal property, you have the right to occupy or use your car. Uh, that is not so an intellectual property, and that's not something that's intuitive. You only have the right to stop others from using your property, but you cannot use your property yourself because for reasons I can't get into, um, uh, it's just by nature of operation of the law. Uh, and, and that is true pretty much across the world. So uh, this is a summary here. Uh, copyrights protect the content or the expression. Trademarks protects the brand in a way that so I, identifies the source, where the goods came from or where the services came from. So Hyatt Hotel provides services. The consumer can associate specific level of services with that brand and, and same thing with uh, say, um, you know, a, a Logitech mouse, you know, consumers can, if it says Logitech, it uses that name, that brand, it tells me sort of what quality or service I'm expecting uh, with that mark. Uh, trade secrets protect confidential information, patents, uh, you know, confidential information on ideas and, and a little bit broader than, than just ideas. Patents is specifically ideas, but the difference is, uh, you know, patents do protect uh, the ideas, uh, but uh, they are limited in time. They're limited to that 20 year. There's two types of patents. The one that most people deal with, the Samsungs and the Apples and, you know, Qualcomm's of the world. Those companies mostly do utility patents. Utility means you are actually seeking protection of a functional idea, something that actually works and operates as opposed to a design. And they have <clears throat> a very few uh, uh, design patents. Uh, and, and so those rights are enforceable in court, just like if you own real estate, you own a house, or if you own a car and somebody infringes, meaning occupies or trespasses on your property, you can go to court and, and remove them. Okay, so let's talk about some of the patent basics and, and it may be a little bit abstract here, but bear with me. I think you'll hopefully get a feel of um, what this whole thing is all about. Uh, just some statistics. I usually start out and show you who are some of the major players. At least this is in. So there was a, a question that flashed on my screen. I want to be able to get that question back. Uh, okay, there we go. I could see the chats now. I clicked, I found the chat button. Okay. Okay, so when it says, the question is whether, when it's something says patent pending, uh, does this mean that they can actually sue? The answer is no. Uh, in most cases, 99% of the cases, they cannot uh, sue. And, and this is, I always use real estate examples because people are familiar with houses and, and buildings and so forth. So it, it's like if you own a land and you haven't built your house yet on the land. So the process of obtaining the patent, protection from the government obtaining patents, uh, that's the process of construction. You're still building the hand. There is no house to rent out uh, yet. Uh, so there's really no house to trespass uh, on, so to speak. So therefore, you can't really go sue somebody to collect rent on the house. Once the house is complete, and you get here in San Diego County, we get certificate of habitability. It's like getting the patent from the patent office in DC. Uh, you can actually go out uh, and now you're property rights, we call them our vested rights, you can go out and see and collect damages. Uh, there are other reasons, uh, actually a couple nights ago, I was lecturing to my law school class. We did cover patent pending. Uh, most of the time is to accrue damages. That's why you have patent pending in the marketplace. 
Okay, so you see IBM has always historically been in the top in terms of the quantity of patents, not necessarily, it's not reflective on the quality uh, or, you know, but it's usually indicative of how inventive the company is. And when I say number of patents is, or, or the fact that you have patents is not indicative of quality, meaning it's not indicative of its economic value, dollar value. And I need to watch my time a little bit here. Uh, I am running behind, but I know you have plenty of time. Uh, it, it's really like owning a house. It makes a huge difference whether you own a house, say, ocean view by the Mediterranean, uh, you know, next to the Raushi, or versus you own a house in the desert somewhere. The values are completely different. It's same thing, you know, uh, the desirability and Likelihood of trespassing is more likely in, you know, if you own an ocean view home versus you own something in the desert. Uh, so one thing to notice here, and if you look in the top 10 filers, um, probably, let's see, I didn't do the count, but uh, five or six of them are not U.S. companies. So it is really a global game. Uh, a lot of uh, companies worldwide are pretty active in it. And you'll see later on that you don't have to be a big company. As long as you have a powerful idea, you can you can pretty uh, uh, use that patent power uh, to get the license fees and and the uh, uh, you know that that you that, that the idea deserves. Uh, so this is natural numbers here. See 20, 2018. I haven't updated for twenty nineteen, but this is something published by the U.S. Patent Office. How many patents are granted every year? And uh, uh, so uh, Samsung, there's a couple of people, that, a couple of entities that we represent that are on the list here. Uh, let's see. So uh, th there was, a, I, I'm using the quid pro quo. This is a Latin term. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with that. It says that you do something for me, I'll do something in return. Um, uh, this was a hot topic uh, back in the fall in early January with the uh, President Trump fiesta, uh, fiesca here that we had uh, uh, an impeachment, but actually, so that was a bad thing in the presidential context, but uh, in the patent context, actually, that's a very good thing, and that's an important thing in the context of patent law. The whole idea of a patent, uh, the government isn't just giving you ownership because it is generous or it wants to be a a good Samaritan here, but is actually uh, serving a public, providing a public service. So the concept is that you, the inventor, come up with a solution to a problem that the world hasn't, doesn't know or hasn't come up with. And you, the uh, inventor, can obtain a monopoly for a limited time, for 20 years, in return, for you to exchange the secrets, the idea behind your invention. So you don't keep it secret at home or in the office, but you actually disclose it to the public. The concept is, and it actually works, uh, you, if you disclose something that's secret to the public, even though the public cannot use it for 20 years, you can actually benefit from that knowledge and they can actually uh, build upon it and come up with other solutions that were hindered by the gap in knowledge of uh, you know of that problem or that industry, so th that's the concept. It is given you. Uh, you have to disclose a secret, disclose it in a way that's enabling uh, and meet certain statutory requirements, and in return, they'll give you that monopoly. And that's what the examination process is about. It's evaluating that that exchange, whether that's happening or not. Um, so okay, so an exchange. You give uh, the idea here. So you give your idea in return, it gives you a path. Okay, I got too many windows here, so I'm going to go ahead and post some of them. Okay, so what are the requirements on the idea itself? And, and this is true across the world, whether you're in Japan or even in London. Uh, Lebanon probably uh, follows more likely the European standard, but there are three basic requirements. 
One is, in order for you to get a patent, the first thing we need to assess is, and that's what the patent examiner does, is whether your idea is actually new. We call that the novelty requirement. And if your idea is novel, uh, that's a first criterion that we must satisfy. Because if it's not new, and new here means something uh, very simple. It's not new if it's in the public domain somewhere, anywhere, in any language, even if it's not known by somebody. So if you have a publication from the 1900s or 1800s that's sitting in a Russian library in the Russian language that nobody knows about, and then you come up with that idea, unfortunately, your idea is old because that idea exists somewhere in the world. You know, it could exist in nature, but an example I use, I use, I said a document. So if your idea is not new, you cannot get patent because by definition, you have to tell us a secret and the secret must be not known. So it makes sense. Uh, second thing is the idea that you're going to give us must be useful. It can't be just something that's you know, a great idea, but it does, it really doesn't have use. And this is more, it doesn't come up with uh, my area of practice. And by the way, I didn't mention this, you know, I'm dumping a lot of information here, but uh, the patent field is split into two major fields, basically technologically. We have the biotech pharmaceutical practice, which is something I know nothing about, um, where you have to be really uh, an MD or a PhD chemistry or something to, to practice that area. Our firm has the largest uh, I, uh, pharmaceutical practice in the United States. So that uh, is where utility, usefulness comes up a lot. So if you say you come up with a cancer drug, that drug must operate, must have utility. Uh, my field of practice is more we call high-tech practice, which is computers and software and medical devices and semiconductors and so forth. So. Uh, that area of practice, I, I hardly ever get a utility requirement. Actually, I don't think I've ever gotten one in 23 years. And, and the reason being is because I work in an exact science area. I work in physics, I work in circuits, I work in software. Uh, I don't work in chemicals and uh, you know levels of uncertainties. So that's the second requirement. That has a low threshold. It's not as, as high as novelty. Novelty, you have to be new. Moving along here, um, third requirement is the patent must be not obvious. And in the United States, we're probably one, the only jurisdiction, maybe there's another one like the Philippines or somewhere, where we use that standard, the non-obviousness standard. It's the same standard, very similar everywhere around the world, but they call it an inventive step standard, meaning your invention is new, but it's not enough for the invention to be new. We have to now, um, I do have a question coming along, uh, which I'll address in a second. Your idea must also be, have the quantitative, qualitative uh, difference, so to speak, between it and what's in the public domain. That difference must be inventive. And we call that not obvious. So in the example I have, you know, it's obvious if two plus two equals a four, but if you come up with a solution that is actually five, uh, then that is not an obvious standard. So the question is, how do we make sure that our idea is new? Um, you're gonna get the academic answer, which is you can never be sure. Uh, that's a great question. But the practical answer is we don't have to be 100% certain. So when I go to the US Patent Office or I go to the EPO, European Patent Office in Munich, and I file my patent application, those examiners there, you know, uh, the, an examiner will be assigned the, the patent uh, application for examination, and he or she is an expert in that field. So if it's a chemical process for making rubber material, that's what uh, the examiner does. So he or she will conduct a search, and now searches are conducted electronically. So they have search tools, uh, you know, online and databases, and they can search um, uh, the invention in the, uh, not only in Europe, but they can search it in across multiple jurisdictions in many languages. So statistically speaking, that gives you a percentage of confidence. You know, you're probably 70, 80% confident 
that the idea is new. But you can never be sure. Uh, uh, so it, it becomes really interesting that, well, when you go to court, you have a patent, you're 70, 80% certain that your idea is, is actually patentable, new. Uh, so what happens? Well, in, in our system, we call the adversarial uh, contentious system in US courts, the opposing party has a tremendous uh, motive to find that piece of prior art, we call it prior art, to defeat novelty. So they actually do a lot more extensive search. They could spend hundreds of thousands of US dollars to find uh, something that defeats the patent and the patent becomes invalid. Uh, but anyway, notwithstanding that, uh, there's many public databases. You can use Google patent, you can search for your uh, invention, or you could use the USPTO.gov. You can also search for inventions there. Uh, so I'll, I'll move right along here. Uh, so this is something very important, very unique to patent law. Uh, it's not intuitive. It's opposite to what you think. The patent that does not give you the right to occupy your property, practice your invention. That's what occupy your property means. It gives you the right to prevent others from actually trespassing or using your idea. And therefore, if somebody wants to use your property, you can collect rent. We call that royalties in the context of patent law. Uh, Google Patents, by the way, is a very effective tool. It's uh, and it pulls out patents from many jurisdictions published in the English language. And if you do a search on patents, that pretty much covers you know eighty percent of what's out there. Uh, so I'll move right along here because I do want to catch up on time. Uh, so value patents. It can if you are a startup company, uh, you can. It can add value to the company. It can actually provide revenues if you go out and uh, license your invention. And also, if somebody, if you need the technology that you have to use because you're making a product, so you need to get a license from somebody else, you can actually use your patents to cross license. Excuse me, I'm going to be moving through these concepts fairly fast to cover everything we got here. Um, so in the context of, uh, you can use them offensively or you can use them defensively, patents. So meaning you can go out and sue people or threaten people to sue them in order to collect royalties so they pay you license fees. Or at the same time, uh, if somebody sues you, you can use them to counterclaim to sue them back. And therefore, it levels the uh, uh, the playing field level, the, the play field uh, in the court, in the contentious, contentious setting, and therefore it encourages settlements. It also demonstrates sophistication. You know, it shows that you're a sophisticated company or sophisticated, sophisticated entrepreneur, and obviously it, uh, a lot of your competitors uh, are getting them worldwide. Okay, so when do you get a patent? When is it time to get a patent? You must get it as soon as possible as you have an idea. And, and the reason you have to get it as soon as possible, you've got to file your patent application, is because uh, the world now, the entire world, uh, is a first inventor to file system. So meaning whoever runs to the patent office and files, they're the one that are gonna get the priority of uh, examination and novelty and so forth. Uh, and because of that, you really need to file as soon as possible. Uh, you don't have to make a product. You don't have to make a prototype. Uh, you can just simply, if you have the idea and you can actually describe it to one who's technical in the field and that person can understand it, that's good enough. That's the threshold that you have to meet. Uh, whenever you have a revision or a product design, you can actually, uh, file for uh, another patent. You can file as many patent applications on the idea as it evolves as, as, as you need to. So this is typically the process of um, what it takes. Um, there's different types of applications that you can file. I won't get into that, but, the, but what you need to know is that uh, 
in the world we live today, there is no international patent. You cannot go to a jurisdiction, United Nations, we have the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, and say, give me an international patent that I can enforce elsewhere. That doesn't exist. I don't know if that's going to exist in, uh, in the next hundred years. It may, it may not. But what there is, is uh, if you file a patent application in Lebanon or in the United States or Europe, you actually have some time, you have about uh, 12 months, one year, in order to decide if you want to go somewhere else outside that first jurisdiction in which you filed, and uh, therefore seek patents in, in foreign countries. You don't have to make that decision on day one. You must file in a single jurisdiction. Uh, you'll see, I'll describe uh, some of the treaties. If you file in the United States, you can file uh, and you know, later on in up to 150, 160 jurisdictions under the ECT, the Bad Cooperation Treaty. If you file in Lebanon, Lebanon is not a member state of the ECT, of the Bad Cooperation Treaty yet. Um, and therefore, uh, Lebanon is a member of the Paris Convention, uh, so you can, you can within one year file in uh, countries uh, that are members of the Paris Convention, which is also it's about 170, 180 countries out there. There's a question here online that says, are we going to discuss NDAs? I wasn't, I don't think I have a comment on it, but it's a very good talk, question and very important topic. Uh, I was talking about uh, the idea of requirement that the invention must be new. Well, there's a protection under the law that says that in order to maintain the newness, the novelty status of your invention, but yet still discuss your invention with other parties and irrespective of the country here, you can uh, do sign a non-disclosure agreement. So have an agreement with the receiving party, the recipient, that any information you're going to exchange must remain confidential. These NDAs can get pretty sophisticated, but uh, that's basically fundamentally what it is. So that concept, if you actually now disclose it to 20 people, and all 20 people were under a strict NDA obligation, non-disclosure obligation, you negated the public disclosure. You are actually, your idea is still secret. Uh, so uh, that is a legal vehicle that protects you uh, is to maintain the novelty standard. That's why companies sign NDAs. But notwithstanding that these sophisticated players in patent law, the companies, they don't, I mean, they sign NDAs. The sophisticated companies, they actually file for patent protection first, then they go out and discuss with other companies. Um, so here you'll see a timeline, you file a patent application in the United States and in Europe and Japan and other places. Uh, it can take uh, quite a bit to examine your invention. Uh, and in, in the US, depending, it all depends on the technology. Some the departments, we call them art units in the patent office have less of a workload so they can go through your application within six months. Um, others uh, can, uh, actually uh, go through, you know, like technology I work in, it can take three, four, five years, but now they, they try to speed things up. So it could take about two to three years to get a first examination report. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, there's <laughs> yet another uh, great uh, question here uh, is, you know, uh, is really IP protection getting in the way of coming up with a humanitarian problem? Uh, we can sit down and talk about this for about um, several days or weeks. Um, I think fundamental, I mean, you do have competing rights here, but fundamentally speaking, the, the idea of giving a monopoly, giving you that incentive is far, you know, financial invent, incentive is far greater incentive to most people, if not all people on this earth, to come up with a solution versus the incentive to really come up with something good for humanity. Um, I mean, not everybody is really like the Bill Gates of the world. Uh, the, so, you know, reasonable minds can differ. 
But that's really the, the motivation behind patents and intellectual property. That's why I think IP protection is has far more benefits for some bias uh, than uh, than not having IP protection. Okay, so can we patent an idea, concept, for example, parking brakes, parking brakes, or anything that prevents the car from moving, or do we have to patent a specific design, for example, a specific mechanical parking brake design? That's getting a little bit into the mechanics of uh, of patent uh, claiming and patent drafting and patent strategy. Uh, the short answer is you can patent an idea at many different levels. So you can patent something that's very, very specific, the actual paper clip or the clip that holds the brake versus the concept of breaking a car, you know, getting a car to a stop, to a, to a complete stop. So anything in between those is protectable. Okay, let's move right, uh, right along here. Okay, my screen is a little stuck here. Maybe I need to. Okay, let's, uh, that's what I was talking about here. So I believe maybe you have the annotate option on and you might yes, want to. Yes, let me try to turn that off. Yeah, turn it off. Okay, now we can go. Thank you, Mona. And then there's a way to erase this thing here. So let me erase uh, clear all annotations. Okay. So, uh, so, so I want to get into a little bit of the international aspect. Uh, there is a question here that I'll, I'll address in a second. But let me get into the international aspect here. So this is very, very important in the patent practice, and it's it's critical to a lot of inventors, is that you don't need to go out to the world and patent your idea through you must only file in a single jurisdiction and you can file multiple applications during that one year period as your idea develops. But within one year, you must convert or pursue patent protection uh, uh, outside of the jurisdiction uh, in which you are uh, pursuing patents. So if you file a patent application in Lebanon and you decide to file in five, six other jurisdictions, you must uh, do so within one year and in this example, after 12 months, you can file what's called a PCT, patent cooperation treaty application. That's managed by WIPO in Switzerland. And uh, you actually, uh, in the United States, we have a receiving office. So I don't actually file my, my application in, in Geneva. I actually file it in DC because the Geneva office has an office, a PCT receiving office in the US. In many other countries that are PCT member states, they have that. You don't have that in Lebanon, but you can file in Lebanon and you can go instead of PCT, you can file under the Paris Convention. Uh, so there's a few questions here. How flexible is, it, is patent protection? Let's say that someone copied our design with a slight change. Can we still use the patent to our advantage and sue them or the and protects only the exact design. Excellent question. That has to do with enforcement. I'm not covering that in my lecture today. But generally speaking, I mean, historically, in the last 40, 50 years, you, you know, it's the exact design plus a little bit of a wider territory. We call that the equivalence territory or doctrine of equivalence. Uh, over the years, that margin of equivalence has narrowed. So it's very narrow protection outside the exact design. So short answer is that it's really the exact precise design. But remember, a patent application or patent doesn't come up with one claim, one territory, but it has multiple claims. So you actually you know, have a lot of variation and, and that's where patenting strategy comes in. Great question. Okay. Uh, so a uh, national phase, if you file a PCT application, you have to go in within a year and a half and internationally decide where you want to go. 
whether it's in the US or Europe and Japan or China, all those are a member. But Taiwan is not a member of the APCT. Uh, China is, you can figure out why Taiwan is not and Lebanon is not. Okay, let's talk about copyrights. But there is, uh, and I'll, I'll be, uh, at the end, I'll be uh, going back to patents because there's a lot of uh, more discussion on patents as well. So when do inventors consult an IP attorney as soon as possible? When they file or only uh, to enforce the patent? Oh, I see. I think the question, will they file or will they only enforce the patent? We do both. So I do patent prosecution. Most attorneys do either or. Uh, there are a few hybrids like me that, that do both. Uh, you, file, pa, you know, I do patent prosecution in my practice, which is the process of seeking and obtaining patents, uh, patent protection, and also I do enforcement or policing, you know, which is before enforcement. Uh, in terms of whether we do searches on patent applications, uh, yeah, we do, but we're fairly expensive, so we don't even bother with it. We just send it out to a search firm uh, that are not attorneys. They're just other technical people that actually uh, can do a search for us. And usually they come back with reasonable, with reasonable results. But that's what patent offices do. You know, uh, if you file, you can file a very cheap a patent application in Italy uh, under the European standard. And they do a, a, a very high quality search at the EPO, at the European Patent Office, um, you know, for you know, very little money uh, without you having to do a search yourself or hiring somebody. Okay, so if we are to patent our idea and they're somewhat similar enough, the same idea patented would you do. In other words, how new is new? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. That addresses the third requirement is. How inventive is it? That I, I cannot answer in a lecture like today because that's what attorneys fight on in court. But I can tell you it's a, it's a it's somewhat of a subjective standard, that uh, inventiveness aspect, okay? So it depends on advocacy and the facts and the evidence that's available, whether you're in court or in the patent office. Uh, but novelty is pretty black and white. Inventiveness, it, it is how new is new, uh, is really how obvious or how inventive it is. New is new is, is a strict standard. It's either out there or it's not. Uh, so that's what we got. Okay, I'm gonna move uh, along here to copyright. Luckily, I only have one slide on each of these secondary topics. So you protect content, you uh, provide authors, with the protection, as long as they're the original, so there's an originality requirement in in uh, copyright law. You have to be the original author, meaning you didn't copy it from somebody else. That's that's what it means. But there is no novelty or obviousness requirement on none of that in copyright. As long as you you're the author of the content, and the content is an expression such as a photograph, uh, a movie, a story, you know, all those are protected. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't cover any something that's functional. So you cannot cover the operation of a pen, but you can actually maybe cover the shape of a pen. And at last, uh, for a very long time, uh, 70 years after the death of the author, and in the event if it's a corporate author, it lasts more than that. Okay, so there's more questions. If we are to patent our idea and there's, oh, not that one. Let's talk about trademarks. So trademarks, as I said, uh, that's something most of you are familiar with because it's everywhere. You know, whether it's a McDonald's sign, a Mercedes sign, something might be so popular in Lebanon, a Coca-Cola. Uh, those names or marks, uh, when you hear them or see them, they immediately identify the source of good, uh, of good or service. And therefore, as a result, uh, it gives you a sense of quality an association of where that product came from. So therefore, that would be protectable under trademark law. Let me try to address a question here. Uh, 
yeah, how can somebody benefit, whether you're an entrepreneur or an individual inventor, benefits from international treaties? Every participant that wants to file or seek patent protection on the property outside one country, uh, they can benefit from the international treaty. So uh, you go to a local lawyer uh, in your own country or jurisdiction, and they can actually seek protection. They contact us in most cases, you know, uh, and they, uh, they can ask us to file and enforce your treaty rights in order to get the priority. Uh, and you preserve your patent rights as of that filing. By the way, when you file a patent application and you wait more than one year, you lose your patent rights internationally, you no longer can pursue them. So I think the trademarks here. Okay, how about trade secrets? Uh, a trade secret is a little broader than patents. So anything, basically, any idea, any concept, any pattern, any any solution, any formula is trade is protected as long as it meets um, you know, the idea of it's uh, has an independent economic value. It is um, uh, what you call it. It's um, uh, not generally known, and you actually take steps of secrecy. Uh, room is getting pride here. We're getting beautiful sun outside the window here. Okay, uh, just some comparison here with other forms of protection. I think a trade secret, it's uh, for you to understand that it. it's closest to patents, except that it can cover our broader things. Okay, so how do you capture IP? And this is really more in the later, uh, was drafted in the context. If you have a company or if you have, if you're working with other people who are working for you and are inventing. Okay, so the very uh, critical thing that you need to do in, uh, in a lot of jurisdictions is you need to make sure that you own the invention. So if you have other people working for you or working with you, or you're talking to other companies, you've got to make sure that you obtain what's called an assignment provision. Uh, and this is an agreement that anything that that comes up or is exchanged, you can actually, um, it belongs to a particular property. In this case, it would be you. Uh, this is done routinely in the United States as part of an employment agreement. So when somebody gets hired by Facebook or other companies, uh, they come in and they sign an employment agreement. In, in that agreement, it has a provision. So now the inventor that's inventing within the company actually transfers the property. Anything he or she invents will belong to the employer. In the United States, that doesn't happen by operation of law. In Japan, Germany, and other jurisdictions, uh, it does happen by operation of law. So, uh, but in the US, you have to, to have a transfer. Do software companies usually file patents? Of course. Uh, so Facebook, you know, you know, Uber and all those guys, uh, they got tons of patents uh, and they file for a lot of patents. So uh, in order for, if you're working with a colleague or a consultant or an employee and they're working all day, they may come up with excellent ideas, really need to create incentive for them to disclose uh, the idea. Even though they're obligated, you know, under the employment agreement, you've got to motivate them and make sure that they actually have a reason to tell you what the what ideas they have. And you know, this is again made for in the context of companies that it's got to be done in a way that's convenient. Uh, you actually, you know, if you have more than a group of people that are working for you, you got to have a committee and make sure that the committee is monitoring these invention. Um, you know, I think develop half weekly meeting and and collect ideas and then make an assessment whether it's something that's important and deserve patent protection. Uh, and there's the idea of recognition. Uh, this is what a lot of companies do. Okay, so uh, this is a, an area that's very, very fuzzy. Well, how do I decide whether, you know, if I come up with an idea, I come up with 10 ideas or 100 ideas a week, I generate a lot of ideas, which one should I pursue? The short answer is we don't know, and, and nobody knows. And that is what, why Microsoft and everybody else and IBM, they file 9,000 patents. 
not because there are 9,000 good ideas, it's because they really don't know which ones of 9,000 uh, patents are really going to pick up and hit the market and eventually become something that's worth worthwhile. So it's like buying land. You know, you go out to the uh, you know to a place, you buy land on the mountains and the valley and the desert and the ocean. You know, you find out that people don't live in the ocean because there's a lot of storms, so they people move inland, so that the you know land becomes more valuable. Uh, you know, in, in those territory. So you really don't know, but there's some general principles, you know. Uh, obviously the bigger the land available scope of protection, the more likelihood you're gonna have trespassers and therefore the more likelihood you're gonna have revenues. Uh, how useful is the invention? This is something that competitors need to use. Doesn't matter if you love the idea and you love using it in the early fascinated about it. What matters is how's the market receiving the idea? Is this something that uh, the market wants to use? So usually simple ideas are very useful, complex ones are not. Uh, how long can you, you know, that idea can be used? Is, is there something that's useful today and then six months from now something better replacement is going to come up? Uh, also you need to evaluate whether you really should keep Invention as trade secret versus disclosing it to the public. Uh, our recipe is protected by IP regulations, like say a cocktail recipe, where it's the only option a trade secret. Yeah, food recipes. Uh, I've never protected a food recipe. Uh, again, we're looking to see in the context of recipes whether something the recipe itself is not protected by patent law. It's, protected by copyright or could be kept as a trade secret because trade secret has a wider net. But if there's a cocktail that provides a benefit or has a function, uh, so I don't know if you were kids, you had those bubbling, you know, fuzzy candy that we used to put on our tongue. That fuzziness, that functionality is patentable, even though the candy the food itself is not patentable. So again, we're looking to see if it has a function, it has a utility, other than, you know, if something satisfies hungers within, you know, if there's something that's new that the invention, the recipe is providing, it could be patentable. Um, I'm gonna just go back up also, uh, in which countries do you decide to patent depends on where the customers and consumers and where the manufacturers are. So you want to go into a market where there's a lot of these players. Also, when you want to patent something, last point is that you want to patent a design that you can detect. That's very easy to detect. If you do, if you patent something that if somebody uses is so difficult for you to detect infringement, it won't be much of much value. So you want to have something that you can actually detect. So here's something that's not intuitive. Uh, you, you know, a lot of people say, and this is what the I, you know, IBM actually does, they, they're interested in the numbers. Oh, we got 9,000 patents. To me, to an IP lawyer, that doesn't mean much. It just means that they filed a lot of patent application. What I need to know as an IP lawyer is not that you own a house or a large building. I need to know what quality of construction you have, where the building is facing, north, ocean, desert, where it's located, what the traffic is like. Those are the criteria that makes your building valuable versus a deserted building no, that nobody wants to go to. So you really need a good contractor that actually knows how to build the building and make a high quality building. So if a storm comes in, we call that the invalidity challenge in the context of patent law, you are able to can defend it. And you can defend it only if you really have uh, good, high quality IP lawyers. So IP lawyers are like any other field. It's a grade. You have not so good, the average, and, and someone who's, uh, you know, really good. And the really good are really few. Uh, so they, they, you really need to hire an expert. Okay. So now I think we're uh, get, getting to our conclusion of our of our uh, last section of my slide here is how do you leverage, how do you actually make value out of IP? 
And there's a question is, can we file a, a U.S. patent from Lebanon? Yes, you can file a U.S. patent from anywhere in the world uh, as long as you use uh, a U.S. patent lawyer that can represent you in the U.S. patent office. Uh, the physical filing does not happen in a Lebanese office, but actually you transmit uh, that uh, to outside Lebanon, the United States, and it gets filed uh, in the in the U.S. patent office. And uh, this is something that's very common, actually, a lot of European clients, they file first in the U.S. and then they decide where to go because there's an efficient way to, to do so in the United States. Um, so let's talk about how do you benefit? Is there a question? Okay. So if now you get an, uh, some form of IP like a patent, what do you do with it? You could actually go out and police it, meaning you can look and see who's infringing, who's actually using your patent or your idea. And therefore, you can try to collect trend. It's just like going, you own several homes, and you go out and check who's occupying your homes, and you collect rent. This is the same thing. If the tenant doesn't want to pay rent, you actually actually have to go to court and enforce, file a lawsuit, file an infringement suit. And when you file a lawsuit, you know, you can go all the way through a trial. Only one or two percent of the cases actually make it to trial. A lot of cases get settled uh, beforehand, and they get settled because you can actually negotiate the license either before you license a final lawsuit or after you file a lawsuit. But you you actually um, in a lot of cases you have to file a lawsuit. Um, So the question is, if you have a patent somewhere, let's say in the U.S., does that prevent others from producing and selling it or both in the U.S.? Great question. This is not something that I get into here. Uh, I did cover that just a couple of nights ago. Uh, so what, what actions constitute patent infringement? So what activity is trespassing? So if you own a house, you say, well, if somebody uh, builds you know, uh, something that encroaches on your balcony or your backyard, uh, that is an act of infringement because that's trespassing. So it's fairly visible. If somebody comes in and, and occupies the roof of your house, that's trespassing. If somebody comes in and occupies your house, that's trespassing. In the context of patent law, there's generally four or four or five, six if you get into FDA uh, filings. But anyway, activities that constitute infringement, you only have to do one of them. If you sell a patented invention, that's an act of an infringement. So that alone uh, entitles you to collect royalties. So if somebody sells, you can go after the seller. Somebody makes, so manufactures the patented inventions. Also in the United States, it's jurisdictional. So if they make it in Brazil, that is not an act of infringement unless you have a Brazilian patent. If you actually, uh, offer it to sell so you don't even have to sell it, you just advertise it, that's an act of infringement. If you actually use the invention, so you can sell, make, offer to sell, use the invention, that is an act of infringement uh, alone. So uh, if I use a cell phone, that's an act of infringement. So uh, you know, I happen to use, use a specific brand. If my manufacturer is infringing you know, Apple's patents, Apple doesn't sue me, even though I am infringing. Uh, there are some protections, and plus um, I'm not deep pockets to Apple, so that's why they don't have an interest in suing me. But they sue the manufacturer, even though I am a user of an infringing product. Uh, so making, using, selling, offering to sell. And the last one is importing in the United States. So even if you don't make use or anything, if you import the product into the United States, that's an act of infringement. So all those activities uh, constitute infringement. So anyway, so if you own IP, you can go collect rent, you can go sue somebody and have them pay damages to you. Uh, and also, 
But what if you get sued, accused of infringement? You know, you can actually, uh, what you have to do is you need to decide whether you're actually infringing the patents. That's something that a casual uh, scientist or engineer or a person can do. You need an expert lawyer that can understand the rules governing infringement. Uh, so you can get what's called the freedom to operate, you know, uh, FTO in opinion, you know, uh, a lot of companies, if they're about to embark on a new design, they get a freedom to operate to see if they can actually make and use the product. Um, if you're also accused of infringement and you believe you have that powerful, we call it prior art, meaning a prior knowledge, uh, knowledge that's, uh, you know, that means the invention is not new. You can actually you go to court on your own initiative, sua sponte, and seek what's called a DJ action, a declaratory judgment action. You go to court and you say, hey, you know, somebody wants to collect rent from me. I'm living in this house. I want the court to say that this party is not the owner of this house. That, that's basically what it is. Uh, that's what a DJ action it says that the patent is not valid that idea territory doesn't belong to the owner and therefore they're not entitled to damages okay so when you seek uh protection think not about again what you want to do or what your company wants to do but actually what competitors are doing this is what's powerful you've got to look out in the world and say what is a powerful idea that someone else can do uh, you know really needs to use our competitors are looking for and you can do this from your own bedroom, so to speak, or basement, if you have one in up, come up with these wonderful ideas, go file for patent protection. Everything is done, done electronically, uh, you know, in the United States, and then hire a lawyer and then, you know, for enforcement and for patent prosecution and have them collect damages for you. So you can make millions, if not billions, you know, the largest judgment in the US, I think was about 1.4, 1.5, billion dollars. It was by a U.S. doctor uh, in, in the Los Angeles area. Uh, I believe it was against Medtronic, so it was in the medical device industry. Also, uh, you can look and see where the market might be headed. So if you want to, you know, anything you're coming up with now is old, is in the market, you've got to look futuristically and see where the market is headed. Uh, this is something that's um, sort of a, some patenting strategies is when you file patent for one idea and that idea is actually fundamental to a science or to an industry, you can make file many, many different patents for that initial idea, uh, even though you don't have improvement, because as long as you describe in your patent application, the various variations or uh, alternatives of the idea. So you can use, you know, maybe aspirin for a headache, but also you can use ibuprofen and you put both of those and then the ibuprofen chemical becomes popular and desirable and that's described. You can actually seek kind of protection on it if those things did not exist in the marketplace. And you can do that uh, for 20 years. So, we talked about valuation and we talked about how, whether or not to file for uh, a patent, depending on what the idea is. Now, what makes your idea valuable? Again, if you come to me, I don't know what the dollar figure is. Uh, actually, that's an accounting function. So there's the Arthur Andersons or uh, accounting firms of the world that can actually do that in consultation with IP experts like myself but they do the financial market analysis. Um, but I can tell you what criteria are, what factors we look for to evaluate whether something is valuable or not. Likelihood of infringement, okay? So the more traffic you have on your land, the more likelihood your land is, is more valuable. You can collect more royalties, more, uh, more parking fees, so to speak. Same thing, the more likelihood your idea is gonna be used in the marketplace, the more valuable your, uh, your idea is gonna be. If your idea gets adopted by an industry standard, you know, in the telecommunication field, there's a lot of industry uh, standards that they come up with. So when they do 
video coding or voice uh, recognition. There are certain standards that you know are the signal propagation have to satisfy. Uh, if your in the idea gets adopted by a standard, everybody that's implementing the standards is going to infringe, so it's going to be worth a lot of money. Uh, broad claims, if you have bigger land, uh, it's more likelihood probabilistically that you're going to be trespassed versus you have very narrow invention, very narrow land, strip of land, there's less likelihood that it'll be. Uh, uh, you can look and see, uh, you know, there's, there's a mechanical way you can look and see how often your patent or is getting cited by other companies um, and that tells you how active that technology is and how like how the value is i just uh, we did some historical uh, studies uh, the average marketable value of a patent is not in the millions it's about 100,000 us but there are some that you know sell for millions and millions you know i worked for uh, we worked for an inventor actually uh, back in uh, late 90s early 2000 that sued logitech and you know he was working from his garage in South Africa, and he made millions and millions off of his idea. We, you know, we ended up, you know, showing eight, nine manufacturers uh, because of that design. So there's a question here. If you legally give someone the right to use your patent, could, could you revoke such license or permission? That's, a, that's not a patent law question. That's a question of contract law. So contract law allows you to contract with others, uh, exchange certain rights. And you can put conditions, whether you're giving an irrevocable license, meaning a license that you cannot take back, or is it a revocable license? So it depends on the terms of your contract. How does IP apply in an academic context? Startups launch from a project of research. Is it the university's property or the students? Great question, very commonly known, UCSD and, and what's uh, Cornell got a really nice judgment uh, in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh maybe about five years ago so in the united states ownership is a question of contract law it has nothing to do with patent law why because a patent is personal property who owns the car is whoever you know uh pays the price and has his name or her name on the title of the car so the way you get ownership and the way universities do such as UC system, and I'm sure the American University in Lebanon probably have similar or should have similar provisions. They must have an assignment invention uh, provision, an invention assignment provision that transfers the property from the student, from the, the teacher assistants, from the professors to the university entity. And that's done through an employment agreement. In that case, that's the university that owns it, and that's the way it is in most sophisticated jurisdiction. And because university own it, any spinoff or uh, you know, any startups uh, emanating from that research that the university uh, spins out as a lot of US uh, academic institutions do, uh, would be owned and by the university initially and then through uh, you know, investors and uh, you know, ownership gets divided uh and to maybe various parties or gets owned by a patent holding company and entity that they would create for that purpose. I think that might be the last slide that I have here. Uh well an hour and a half. Uh I don't know if you have other questions, but we can certainly take a few minutes to answer questions. Uh So I believe we might have a few more questions. So if you have any, you can either unmute and ask the question on uh, audio or how many others have been doing. Okay, well, there's a great question. A lot of great questions here. I feel that I'm, uh, uh, you know, as if you guys are in the San Diego environment, there's a question that says that I heard the myth that software can be I cannot be IP protected, but they can only get copyright protection. Is that true? Uh, there's a lot of validity to this myth. Um, so historically, uh, software, because it's an expression, a software meaning 
the actual code itself, yeah, you can get that uh, copyright protected. There's little value in doing so uh, because, uh, you know, some of you who design software or who are software engineers uh, and computer scientists, you know that it's not of how you actually express right the code, but it's actually the algorithm, the process that you're actually, that the code is executing. That's really what, where the value is. Uh, so uh, that got resolved about 30, 40 years ago. So in the 80s, uh, it became pretty clear that software is patentable. Uh, and uh, I don't wanna complicate the response, but that lasted until about uh, maybe five or six years ago. Uh, I mean, the concept in the United States was you can patent anything under the sun. And that was a quote from a US Supreme Court case. Uh, that basically was encouraging patent filings, basically anything that you want. So software was made, obviously, anything under the sun or anything in a basement or in an office. Uh, the, so software was clearly patentable. But five, six years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court, in my view, and a lot, and I view a lot of IP practitioners, screwed things up for us, basically. They, they said, well, we don't want to be patenting abstract ideas. We don't know really what abstract ideas now, well, what they really are. But short, short answer is software is an abstract idea. And there's some maybe uh, industrial forces uh, that are in favor of patenting uh, software and some others that are against patenting software. So there's some politics there. But notwithstanding that, so software are abstract. So it was restricted as to what kind of software patents we can get. They were not banned completely, but there were criteria, additional criteria that software would have to meet. That is the case in Europe, and that's the case in most of the jurisdiction now, is that software is definitely protected by patents, and but it does need to meet additional criteria. And, and uh, luckily, uh, in January 2019, the decision by the Supreme Court was interpreted and maneuvered a little bit that now the uh, it, it is easier to get patent protection on software that, that's sort of a short answer okay after a patent expires can a person still profit for licensing um, a little bit so you can there's clear law established in the u.s whereby and that's probably valid in europe as well once the patent expires you cannot license something that that is in the public domain because after 20 years the invention belongs to the public public uh, however you know you can imagine technical you know technology companies are very innovative that they say oh, oh, oh you know the patent expired but we're still offering know-how licensing the know-how and the expertise that we have and the services we provide so yes there are ways depending on how the license agreement is written it can actually expand beyond the patent monopoly term, uh, although it's it's somewhat limited. So okay, so a question. Question. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, she's saying, can I file a single patent for a set of products that under the innovative idea, how dissimilar two patents should be in order to be filed separately? Uh, yeah, there's many, many questions in this simple question. So uh, can you file a single patent to cover multiple products? I remember the patent doesn't cover from the legal standpoint, it's not covering a product, it's covering an idea, a concept. Uh, and if that idea is implemented in multiple products, then obviously multiple products would have the patent marking on them and therefore uh, would be covered by that patent. So, yeah, conceivably you could have multiple products. But how different the patents can be uh, between among themselves, we go back to those uh, fundamental principles that I discussed earlier. A patent, patent number two, must be novel and obviously useful but novel and has the inventive step 
relative to the prior art. And prior art includes all of the previously uh, filed and issued patents. Uh, so it has to be that different. The exception is if you're filing continuation applications, whereby uh, you file a first patent and then you file a second, third, and fourth, and so forth all claiming priority to the initial patent file. I'll describe it to you very, very simply. Uh, so if you build a, a house with one floor, that's your first patent, and now you build a house on the second floor, that's a continuation. So there, you don't have to establish any difference between the second and the first house. But if you want to go out and get new territory, you're going to have to go back to the initial criteria. So patents last 20 years, as was mentioned before, and it's 20 years from the initial filing date. And that's pretty mm -hmm. much uniform around the world because of the international treaty uh, uh, that to which uh, a lot of countries adhere to. So Dr. Tomazen Sarir uh, asks if anybody can protect a new software component that uses or is part of open, soft, open source software. Is that possible? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, yes, you can put anything that you add to an open source software. For those of you who don't know open source, open source is, a, is sort of a, a standard in association here in the United States, whereby uh, software designers and software drafters decided that if if they write software, they wanted to give open and free license to for people to use it, and therefore bypass the patenting, uh, the monopoly protection, uh, and therefore the agreement that if you use open source protect, uh, software, you are to do the same thing. Uh, you must give a, a royalty-free license, uh, make your software open so source as well. Uh, so. There are mechanisms, whether the open source is a, an essential component of your software, whether it's actually a side subroutine or function that you actually use, and it's not integrated in your software. Because once it's integrated in your software, you, your software becomes subject to the open source license restrictions, and therefore you cannot really collect royalties on it. Uh, there's a good question in terms of medical products. Uh, what if uh, I file a patent application on a medical product, new drug composition, or you know, uh, heart stimulating device, versus uh, you know FDA approval process? What if the FDA says that your drug is not approved? You have to go back to the drawing board. Uh, very simple. We really don't care much what the FDA thinks because the criteria are different. Uh, we are looking for novelty. We're looking for inventive step or obviousness. We're looking for some level of utility. Now, if your drug is not safe, that doesn't matter for the patent context. The FDA is evaluating safety and evaluating efficacy and all those criteria and, you know, through, uh, the trials that it does. So it, it is a much different organization or association looking at completely different things. So this doesn't mean if your drug is not very effective or is not or is harmful, it, the knowledge is certainly beneficial to the public and therefore the patenting you know, might be warranted. So do business consultants that do not produce patentable IP for their client, but perhaps write reports or strategies, just project, just protect your, their IP via copyrights or in other ways that are negotiated? I, I'm not clear on the question, but I, uh, if you're a consultant and you uh, are obviously coming up with designs, you call it reports and ideas and all that stuff, uh, in U.S. law, uh, the consultant owns the ideas and the inventions de facto by operation of, of fact and law. However, 
a consulting agreement that would be entered between the party uh, and, and the consultant would often transfer that right to the, you know, from the consultant to the party and therefore the party can file for patent protection if it wants to versus other types of protection. Are there differences between an IC layout design, industrial design, as an IC layout design eligible for patent protection? Um, the layout design itself, certainly it's protected by uh, copyright protection, you know, if it's a layout, but the layout, if it has a functional effect, of course it's patentable. If it's got a functional benefit, functional uh, design, uh, it, it can be protected, yes. I hope that answers the question. Okay. All right, so I have uh, from Ibrahim also. There's okay. another myth that Lebanon does not sign the international copyright agreement, so it doesn't adhere to IP protection. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I am sorry. I'm one of those people that's humble enough to tell you I, I don't know if Lebanon is part of the international copyright uh, agreement. Uh, I, I don't do much copyright law because it's a fairly clear, clerical uh, type of a process. We actually have a paralegal that will, uh, you know, work with a, a more of a junior lawyer that will do copyright protection. So I don't know uh, if Lebanon is or not. I can tell you uh, in the patent context, uh, clearly Lebanon is not, have been trying to be a cent to the patent cooperation treaty, the PCT treaty, but it has not. Uh, done so. Okay, uh, uh, that's all I have. Uh, I think you have my email and phone number. I periodically get, um, you know, people calling me or emailing me with questions, so feel free to do so. So thank you a lot for your time and for a really very valuable session. With, by the way, we had not just students, we had several faculty members, we had also some AAV staff members, and we had some externals, uh, whether they have just from the LabNet invitation or from, uh, you know, social uh, media announcements. Uh, so, I mean, I hope they have also enjoyed and benefited from the uh, from the session. So thank you a lot, uh, Mr. Mark Avomeri, again. Uh, we really um, appreciate uh, being with us, putting this effort and time, and we definitely hope to have uh, more of such sessions, uh, whether it be a webinar where we can also have some physical interaction through our engineering lecture hall, or maybe in the future, if we can have you in person, that would be great, or just have uh, online hours. Also, it's, I mean, we are making the best use of technology, so it's not that bad. Okay, well, I welcome the opportunity. I, uh, obviously, I've been to Lebanon many times, and in the past, when I went as, as far back as 2000, 2005, I often get uh, uh, asked to give a talk. I, I know I've given several talks with a very tech organization in Lebanon, so um, I'd be happy to do so on the next in the next opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to stop the recording.